Good day, good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me for this interview. Uh, my name is Galina Angarova. I come from the Abzai clan of the Iherit nation of Buryat peoples. Uh, we are peoples in Siberia on both sides of uh, Lake Baikal. And you might have heard about this lake. It, we, it's a, the largest freshwater lake in the world containing 20% of the world's fresh water. I identify myself as a, an indigenous woman, a daughter of my peoples, uh, and then as a, an indigenous rights activist, as a climate activist, land rights activist, um, and I serve as the executive director of Cultural Survival. Uh, Cultural Survival is a 50-year-old indigenous-led indigenous rights organization. The organization works in service to indigenous peoples, is led by indigenous peoples, supports indigenous people's self-determination, cultures, and political resilience. We are currently a staff of 36 people, um, mostly indigenous, mostly uh, women working from our, our own communities, serving our own communities globally in uh, 11 countries, I think, at the moment. So we work on the nexus of five uh, themes that we have identified as some of the most important themes for indigenous peoples. It's um, climate change, lands and livelihoods, cultures and languages, uh, indigenous community media. And crossing all these themes are, are, is the leadership of indigenous women and youth as the change makers and protagonists for the future, for the common future that we're all aspiring for. And we have a set of four strategies that we're using to fulfill our mission. It's through advocacy, capacity building, communications and grant making. I think I'm proud of all of our work. Just a few examples is that as a communications and media organization, in addition to everything that we do, we have a wide reach. We manage a network of 1,600 radio stations globally. We have relationships. We help support, uh, and we help and support building radio stations from ground up, train staff to run the radio stations, especially focusing on indigenous women and youth. And through that network, we are able to reach 11 to 50 million people, indigenous peoples living in rural communities and provide that access to information that otherwise wouldn't be able to be shared, right? And radio in most communities, indigenous communities is probably the only source of information. So you know, can understand how important it is that that information that's transmitted through radio is culturally relevant, true, because we also fight misinformation through the radio stations and delivered in indigenous languages. That's what our strength is. Another strength is that I'm really proud of our grant making facilities. We have two funds within cultural survival. One is called the Keepers of the Earth Fund and the second one is the Indigenous Community Media Fund. And both funds support self-determined priorities of indigenous peoples. Like through Keepers of the Earth Fund, we fund projects on languages revitalization, cultural revitalization, climate change solutions, indigenous climate change solutions, right? Food sovereignty, a range of projects, but they are self-determined by the communities themselves because they are the best experts on their land and they know what they need. And through Community Media Fund, we support communications efforts, what communities want to communicate to their community members and to the rest of the world. Radio stations or indigenous TV stations or murals, painting, other ways to communicate because the spoken word or the written word are not the only, not the only 
ways to communicate out there. I'm also proud of our advocacy. Tomorrow, I'm flying to Brussels with some members of my team to meet directly with members of the European Parliament. We're working on three pieces of le legislation. Corporate sustainability due diligence law. We're working on the EU battery regulation and the Raw Materials Act. Why is this important? Because as indigenous peoples, we have identified that if we're not at the table, we're on the table. We have to be present in the spaces where our fates, our fates are decided. We need to be, make sure that there are mechanisms, safeguards in place because what happens in the markets, like the European Union, which is the largest market in the world, consumer market with 700 million people, that ultimately the value chains and the supply chains will reach, will impact indigenous peoples. Think about it. More than 50, 53% of so-called transition minerals such as cobalt, copper, lithium and nickel the deposits with these minerals are situated either within or in the very close proximity to indigenous people's territories. And of course, the demand that we have in so-called Western world will affect these communities worldwide. And this is why we're going there to put the face on the issue. I'm not just a hypothetical indigenous person. I am a person. You know, we all have families, our lives are going to be affected by the extraction. Can we make sure that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is being operationalized? The free, prior and informed consent is being respected, upheld in the places where this extraction is planned or either planned or already happening on the lands of Indigenous Peoples. So that's just one example of the advocacy that cultural survival does. Yes, yeah, so the, the name emerged 50 years ago, right? So it has become apparent at that time that indigenous cultures and languages need to survive. They absolutely need that, that the general population needs to realize the importance of indigenous knowledge systems. 25% of the world's surface, terrestrial surface, is managed by indigenous peoples. And these territories are a home to 80% of the remaining biological diversity. There is a lot of data that shows that biodiversity thrives even better in lands of indigenous peoples compared to specially protected areas. But they have been very problematic, by the way, the protected areas, because they displace indigenous peoples in the name of conservation. We have that name, cultural survival, it all reflected that intention. But what we're trying to do today is to move from survival to thriving, to thriving cultures. And the moment is now. The moment I think that more and more people realize how it is important to support indigenous peoples, how it is important that they stay on their territories and remain to be the guardians or the stewards of that thriving diversity. Because without that, without that, we're going to extinction. I think in many cultures, many elders have prophesied that indigenous peoples will take the lead. And there will be the time when people, the general population, have to listen to indigenous leaders. Because they come with millennia old traditional knowledge. Doesn't it make sense? They come with that millennia old traditional knowledge that could benefit us all, everyone. How to live in harmony with a non-human kin. We live in a world that is so anthropocentric. We view everything as a service to humans, but we're just one little piece in this puzzle. We need to learn how to live in harmony 
and indigenous peoples have that knowledge. Indigenous peoples have already crossed the landscape from being victims, from being ben so-called beneficiaries, to being active participants, being the change makers and the protagonists in our life stories. So we're moving away from survival to thriving. But unfortunately, survival is still on the table. changing the mindsets because we live in the the world where the mindset of scarcity is prevalent we have to arrive to the mindset of abundance not thinking of, of self alone but thinking of other people how are you in service to other people are you coming into a conversation to take or are you coming into the conversation to give the reciprocity is one of the main principle and value for many indigenous communities. And we forgot that. How am I coming into this conversation? What, what kind of energy am I carrying with me? Is important. So when everybody goes deep inside and checks themselves against whether they're coming from the place of scarcity or from the place of abundance. Just questioning. That will bring change. So indigenous led funds play an important role. Our first meeting as a working group on indigenous led funds was in 2018. In 2019, we got together for our second meeting, and at the time, we only had 10 funds. Now, they're well-established funds globally. They're global, regional, local funds. In this gathering, third uh, Indigenous-led fund meeting, we had 36 funds. What does it tell us? It tells us that Indigenous peoples are rising. And I think that philanthropy needs to go beyond misconceptions and biases against indigenous led funds and indigenous peoples that we cannot run our own institutions or our funds, we can and we will. We have the knowledge, we have the ability, we have the expertise. We're going to build the youth to keep doing the work that our elders like Mirna Cunningham from Pawanka Fund Tarsila Rivera Zea, a Quechua leader, president of FEMI, they have started that a long time ago. We can make it happen. And that's why we grew beyond that, just a working group on, of indigenous-led funds to become the global alliance of indigenous-led funds. We have a lot of plans. And uh, I welcome, I welcome everyone to invest in the global alliance and put the money where it should be. So I think the beauty of indigenous-led funds is that we come from that set of values, ab abiding to the values of trust, reciprocity, relationships, redistribution, humility. It's like with our funds, wherever we go, any community we go, we have to come with a, from the place of humility. We're not the smartest people at the table community members, elders, are the ones that we have to listen to because they come from that wisdom. I'm still learning. I'm like first grade. Our elders are knowledge holders and indigenous peoples. They kind of used to give out for free and they asked for a lot of free labor. One time I received 26 requests a week, in one week, for, to give free labor to other organizations. This is not the way. Because we pay for high, a sort of high-end consultants. It's a usual thing in the Western world. But for some, somehow it has become a common thing that we are not compensating indigenous peoples for their contribution. 
indigenous traditional knowledge is expertise. It needs to be compensated. I have my own opinions about 30 by 30. It sounds nice, right? 30 by 30. What, the, what does it really mean? It's just a play of words. We need real action. I, we have a whole analysis of, uh, of the negotiations. I was there uh, in Montreal uh, in December. I think we've achieved a lot during the negotiations, but 30 by 30 remains a problem. We don't, we ho I hope that it's not just another land grab to get to the lands and trillions of dollars that are locked in the lands of indigenous peoples by corporations and governments. Because things can't be interpreted in so many ways on national levels. Yeah, we have this global framework, but it's the national governments who decide what's gonna happen on the local level. And we know we have the experience of displacement by large conservation groups and cahoots with governments. So, we'll see. I'm always hopeful. I see the world as a glass half full. I'm always hopeful, otherwise there's no reason to exist. Hope is a muscle. You have to exercise it daily. If I lose hope, there's nothing for me to do out there. I hope that the, and I felt like the wheels are turning, that more resources will be available to indigenous peoples for their work. There's more recognition of indigenous contributions globally. I see it more and more in press, in media, even among governments. You know, there are 20 references to indigenous peoples throughout the new global biodiversity framework. Right? So multiple, multiple references, but we need to make sure those references do not stay on paper. They get implemented. That's what I'm hopeful for. Again, hope is a muscle. You need to exercise it daily.